Imagine a tiny pearl. It's beautiful. It's pleasing to the eyes. It holds so much within it. That pearl may be the product of a lifetime. However, in our hands, that pearl is so much more fragile than it is in the hands of nature. Our planet, floating through the vast emptiness of space, is but a tiny pearl in the grand scheme of the universe. The seven trillion of us human beings do indeed possess the power to destroy our planet with one collective swipe. However, we must work to protect our planet. To truly protect our planet, though, humanity has not done enough and we are not doing enough today. Most of us are familiar with the basic science behind what we are doing to our planet, behind what is causing climate change. No, not that it is a hoax for China by China. <laughs> Ever since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, humanity has had a lust for more. We want to get done as much as we can with as little effort as possible. Contrary to popular belief, this is not unique to high school students. Instead, this is only natural. After all, progress is often derived with a quest for more, often with less. However, even as humanity's knowledge and prowess has been thrust forward, our, our, the health of our planet has taken a nosedive. Exploiting our resources for the past three centuries, we have burnt fossil fuels, releasing prodigious amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This carbon dioxide acts as a greenhouse gas. It traps heat in that would otherwise radiate away from the planet. Just like a car on a hot Fresno day, heat can get in, but it can't get out. Unfortunately, with Earth, we can't just roll the windows down. So instead, we must suffer the consequences. Earth warms to levels far beyond natural. The sea levels rise as the ice caps melt. The oceans are acidified. Ecosystems collapse. And before long, our entire human way of life may be threatened. In fact, it is projected that within the next century, major metropolitan areas globally maybe underwater, starting with Kolkata in India, my parents' hometown. The truth is, most of us have heard little bits and pieces about climate change. Yet as human beings, as the most advanced species on this planet, it is our duty to do everything in our power to be our planet's patrons. We must ensure that our progeny do not have to suffer as a result of our actions or lack thereof. After all, 97% of scientists agree that human beings are causing modern climate change. 97%. Fortunately, however, like so many things today, our actions regarding climate change have become a partisan issue. Facts are often stretched to promote inaction. While one side of our mind tells us to believe the scientists, to do what is almost certainly right, the other simply hunts for excuses to maintain the status quo. You see, that other side of our mind is daunted by the looming prospect of what all of our actions are leading up to. As human beings, we have difficulty in understanding the monumental, yet snail-paced changes that we are making to our planet. Human beings simply aren't wired to understand concepts that exceed lifetimes. As a result, many of us just write climate change off as fake. Even the most stable of the geniuses among us may go so far as to call it the global warming hoax. Facts and logic say otherwise. Others of us, may point to economic issues that would arise from actions that you could take regarding climate change. Some may say that the coal and oil industries in America would be absolutely deprecated 
and as, those, and as a result, millions of jobs may be lost. To them, I say, sometimes new industries replace the ones that are old and becoming obsolete. New jobs would replace the old. America could become the new epicenter of energy globally in a brighter tomorrow. We could become the center of solar, of wind, of hydroelectric, of geothermal energy. Instead of being dependent on other countries for our energy, we could provide it worldwide and become, a lead, become the leaders of a brighter tomorrow. Still others may point to the facts themselves. I've had people come up to me and tell me, Neil, you're such a lunatic buying into all this nonsense. You're not looking at the bigger picture. Earth has been warmer before. What a buffoon. <laughs> Let's talk some more about this. During the last major warming event, the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, also known as the PETM, Earth was indeed far warmer. 55 million years ago, during the PETM, temperatures were so high that the, it's simply inconceivable to modern human beings. We are talking rainforests in Antarctica. That warming was also onset by an increase in carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, giving further precedence and credence to the idea that our modern carbon dioxide emissions are indeed driving Earth's temperatures up. However, the difference between the PETM and climate change today is that the PETM occurred at a much slower rate than today's global warming. Back in a race to warm the planet, the PETM would be the tortoise to today's hare. Back then, carbon dioxide emissions were at an insane 200 megatons per year. However, that is absolutely dwarfed by today's rate of a ludicrous 10,000 megatons of carbon dioxide emissions every single year. So yes, it is true. The planet has been far warmer than it is going to get within the next century, the next two centuries, maybe even the next three centuries. But that's not the issue. Evolution and adaptation take millennia to proliferate through entire populations. And as a result, life will suffer much more dire consequences from our haphazard activities than any natural warming. So let's fulfill the analogy of the tortoise and the hare. Let's stop our current warming trend on its tracks and let the PETM hold the record for the most warming of our geological era. Because if we don't, a 108 degree day in Fresno will be the very least of our worries. <laughs> so how do we do this, you ask? How do we human beings stop climate change? Well, as I've already noted, we seem to have an inbuilt resistance to making large changes. However, the largest of changes are the ones that have the largest of impacts. So sometimes we can enlist the help of government. Those of us who believe in our own planet and those of us who are environmentally conscious may push our government to set, to sign treaties, set limits, enact incentives. We've already done this before. We were able to get our government to sign the Paris Climate Treaty, along with nearly every single other government worldwide. We also were able to get our government to set new cafe fuel economy standards on our vehicles. We were able to get our government to set solar and electric vehicle incentives. Already, we were beginning to see the benefits from all three of these pieces of legislation. Unfortunately, however, the political pendulum swings, and with it, so do policies. It did not take long for a government to quickly remove, for a new government to quickly remove each of these policies. But that does not mean that we should just take a back seat and let our planet be destroyed. In fact, 
legislation is a way of the government forcing us to make changes and protect our own homes. People should not have to be forced to protect their own homes. We should want to protect our own home. So let's not wait around for the politicians. If every single individual were to get solar and drive an emissions-free vehicle as their next car, much of the problem here would be solved. After all, transportation and electricity demand are the two main sources from which carbon dioxide emissions occur. There certainly are world-leading geniuses like Elon Musk who are working on, these, on solutions to these problems at companies like Tesla. However, <laughs> however these are long-term plans and will take decades to proliferate through the entire population. Many of us can and should jump onto the electric car and solar bandwagon. However, not all of us can. Maybe you are an environmentally conscious, earth-loving individual. Maybe you drive the latest electric car or have solar. Well, thank you. Thank you for helping to save our planet. For the rest of us, we simply must be more efficient with what we already have. For one, according to the National Highway and Transportation Authority, over 60% of the trips that American take, Americans take are under 10 miles. These miles account for over 25% of the miles driven each year by Americans. If instead of driving, if we could walk, bike, take public transport, even carpool these distances, we could save nearly 300 megatons of carbon dioxide emissions each year in the United States alone. To put this in perspective, this is more than what was emitted during the last natural warming, the PETM. With a very few changes to our lifestyle, we could have a significant impact. In addition, if we were to stop using plastics, if we could stop using reuse, or if we could stop using plastic plates, knives, and bags, we could save up to another 60 megatons of carbon dioxide emissions each year in the United States alone. Of course, this wouldn't, be, this wouldn't go all the way to solving the problem. We would have a lot of work left to do. However, as we do continue moving on to a future where clean energy and clean transportation take over, in the United States alone, we would save 4,000 megatons of carbon dioxide emissions. Let that sink in for a second. It is important to note, however, that change does come from a grassroots level. Thus, we must do what we can, and we must start somewhere significant. So let's stop the bickering. Facts are not meant to be partisan. When it comes to climate change, it is time for us to take a better look at the bigger picture and to take actions closer to us. For if we don't, we can never get back our Earth. After all, a pearl that is shattered can never be put back together. Thank you. <laughs>